Hello and welcome! I'm DDF Racer, and today I'm taking a look at the new GT4 DLC pack for Assetto Corsa Competizione. Now this is a big one, a literal game changer, and it's good, <laughs> it's very good. But what actually is it? Well, as of the 15th of July, the following cars are available to drive in ACC. The Alpine A110 GT4, the Audi R8 LMS GT4, the Aston Martin V8 Vantage GT4, the BMW M4 GT4, the Chevrolet Camaro GT4, R, the Ginetta G55 GT4, the KTM Crossbow GT4, the Maserati Gran Turismo MC GT4, the McLaren 570S GT4, the Mercedes AMG GT4, and the Porsche 718 Cayman GT4 Club Sport. Now as you might expect, these cars aren't free. This is an add-on to the base game which you'll need to pay for, much like the Intercontinental Circuit Pack released in February earlier this year. Currently, the GT4 Pack DLC will set you back $19.99 in US dollars or euros, or $17.99 in British pounds. Or if you're one of those strange upside down people living in Australia like me, $30.38. Assetto Corsa Competizione has been out for a couple of years now and has been steadily growing, one update at a time. And this latest DLC pack really expands the content list, which is quite a contrast to how this game started out. For the initial early access release back in September 2018, the only car and track available to drive was the Lamborghini GT3 at the Nürburgring. Since then though, the developers Kunos and 505 Games have drip fed us new cars and circuits to the point where we now have a comprehensive grid with the likes of the Bentley Continental, Nissan GTR, McLaren 720S and even the Jag G3 by Emil Frey. This is no means an extensive list, but you get the idea. Lots of GT3s. And that was one of the loudest criticisms I heard about ACC prior to this new DLC pack. There was only one type of car to drive, and GT3 has already been done to death by pretty much every other sim out there. Our Factor 2, iRacing, Project Cars, Race Room, they all have a mighty GT3 roster, so what's so special about ACC? Why should you sink your time and money into a sim that literally only offers this one type of car? Well, to put it in the most simple terms, the level of detail in Assetto Corsa Competizione is like nothing else. By focusing on only a handful of cars and giving them their utmost attention, Kunas have brought us some of the most complex and customizable cars ever known to sim racing. Each contender comes with the true-to-life fuel maps, interiors, handling, and just I don't know, the only way I can describe it accurately is these cars feel authentic and full of life. Not only the cars though, the circuits are all absolutely top notch with complete laser scans and so much attention to every centimetre of the track surface, curbs and runoff areas. The immersion is second to none, helped hugely by the excellent sound design. And that's quite a statement coming from a race room fanboy like myself. The setup options are vast too. I mean, come on, you can even pick which specific tyre sets and brake pads you want to use, all with their own individual wear levels and characteristics. There's also a full day-night cycle, full dynamic weather system, great AI, the ability to load and save offline events mid-session so you can actually do a 24-hour race by yourself if you wanted to, in-game car customization, including helmet and race suit design, rapid loading times, and of course, the absolutely fantastic graphics. Well, as long as you're not using VR, that is, but that's a whole different video topic right there. An hour can go by in a set of course of competition in the blink of an eye, and it won't get any less enthralling. It's an absolute joy to drive. The cars have a real feeling of weight to them, and perfectly walk the line of not being an absolute death trap to drive, with every corner being an exercise in survival, but at the same time, they still require some real skill to extract the really quick lap times. Hopefully, you get in the picture by now, guys, but if not, let me spell it out for you. ACC is awesome. So, getting back to the intended topic of this video, sorry guys, I got a little bit distracted there. You can see why this new GT4 pack is such a big deal. ACC isn't just all about the GT3 anymore. You can now have academy style races with just the lower GT4 class, an approach I could see adopted by many leagues actually as a kind of progression system before they let them join in with the big boys in GT3. GT4 racing by itself is inherently great fun, I mean, 
Who doesn't love a good old Ginetta showdown? But it gets really interesting when you start mixing these classes together. Unfortunately, that is not an option when racing against the AI in a set of course a competition right now. Just confirming it and putting it out there. You cannot mix GT3 and GT4 in the same race offline at the moment. Maybe in the future, hopefully. Please, come on Kunos, make it happen. Now you can do multi-class online, but I haven't had much opportunity to try that out yet, unfortunately, so I can't really comment on it in great detail. Watch this space though, because I plan on doing some test sessions with the OzNZ sim racing guys real soon. Either working your way through the traffic as a fast GT3 car, or being mindful of the blue flags in the slower GT4 car, taking part in a race with different classes just adds a whole other level to how you approach driving, your strategy, and your situational awareness. If you're smart, you can use it to your advantage, and if not, well, you can end up losing valuable time. It mixes things up, and is probably one of the main draws of endurance events, which is what ACC does so well. When you think of multi-class endurance, the first thing that might spring to mind for many of you may be prototype cars. LMP1s at Le Mans, Daytona prototypes at, well, Daytona? Sadly, I don't think these will be coming to Assetto Corsa Competizione anytime soon. It'd be incredible if they were, but I think TCR cars are more likely since the developers have the license for, and are working hand in hand with, the SRO Motorsports Group, who are responsible for the Real World Series which featured GT3, GT4, and, you guessed it, TCR. But no prototypes. For that kind of racing, at the moment your best bet is probably R Factor 2 or iRacing, which both offer laser scan replicas of all the best endurance circuits and feature both LMP and GT cars. R Factor 2 recently hosted the official WEC Virtual 24 Hours of Le Mans, so it doesn't really get a better endorsement than that. They race out of the final corner. The flag is waved. As far as GT4 is concerned though, Assetto Corsa Competizione is where it's at. Beyond a doubt, at the time of recording this video, I've done several races against the eye and driven each of the new GT4s a fair go in practice and... Wow. <laughs> Just wow. These, these cars are expertly represented. All the little details you've come to expect from ACC are there, and they just feel amazing to drive. The handling is just absolutely sublime, although it does take a little bit of getting used to at first. However, before you even make it out on track, the first thing you notice difference is the menu system. Along the top of the screen, you now have a GT4 selection menu, much in the same way you could previously select from the 2018-2019 GT seasons or the Super Trofeo. Clicking on this GT4 button will take you to the GT4 car selection page and the rest of it's pretty much the same to be honest, not much need to report there guys. Getting into these GT4 cars for the first time, I had to readjust my driving expectations slightly. My previous notions coming from the GT3s of how much grip I would have were completely wrong and actually I'm not going to lie, it was incredibly frustrating for the first few laps. It felt like snail's pace, like just the car had no grip, just understeer all over the place and to be honest it was very unsatisfying. The trick was to do a reset in my brain and just start over, just get rid of the whole I should be able to push much harder than this mentality and then with a little patience it just clicked and it all made sense. Oh and the fact that the GT4 cars don't have tyre warmers makes the first few laps incredibly tricky as well. You have to be so careful on the outlap, trust me. Even on the second lap you're still not quite able to push properly, so if you're used to coming out of the pits with optimal tyres or you haven't really experienced the joys of going through a warm up phase yet, then you're in for a surprise, but to be honest, I think it's great. It just adds another strategic layer to the racing and puts you in the same position that the real drivers would be in. I've said this before in some of my other videos, but in general, the cars in ACC feel slow somehow. I mean, of course, GT cars aren't slow by any means, they're finely tuned racing machines with global manufacturer support, but compared to other sims, it really feels like you have to drive slow to go fast. When I first tried this sim earlier in the year, I was sliding wide at every corner, missing my braking points and just generally driving very scruffily, which are all symptoms of pushing too hard. Once I smoothed out my inputs and dialed it back though, the time just started to drop rapidly and I realised that to be quick in ACC, you need to be smooth and precise. You can't just throw these things around the track and expect it to stick. Weight transfer and the traction circle is a real thing here. And that's no exception with these GT4s. Of course, each car has its own unique handling quirks and place in the overall balance of performance. More on that in a moment. But as a whole, you'll definitely have a lot less grip than you're used to in ACC. GT4 is generally considered to be the entry-level series to GT racing and is often simply just 
publicly available factory built racing machines, which obviously are thoroughly tested and homologated by the FIA to be as close as possible on performance. You don't have as much grip or power in a GT4 car, so the emphasis is placed on maintaining momentum and cornering speed through progressive inputs. Hitting your marks in these things is essential as if you miss your break point or run wide just a little bit at the apex, it's going to cost you all the way down the next straight. And also many corners which are once flat out will now need a slight lift so you'll find yourself braking earlier than normal and you'll find yourself waiting longer than normal to get back on the accelerator again. But interestingly enough, these cars feel like you can actually push them harder than a GT3. You're not relying on the aerodynamic grip, you're more relying on the mechanical grip and you just feel like you can lean on the cars a lot more than you could in a GT3 where it would say for example just snap loose or run out of grip. You don't get that in these cars. They slide around a lot more underneath you. There's a lot more compliance in, in the way these things drive. Whilst all of this is going on though, you still get access to the tweaks and adjustments that you previously had in the GT3s. Across the GT4 class you have access to and can adjust from within the car, ABS and traction control, but you don't get engine mix modes. That That's, that's purely the stuff of GT3s unfortunately, none of that in the GT4s. Well, apart from the Maserati that is, just a disclaimer, because that doesn't even have ABS or traction control. You can still change the brake pads in a race and still choose specific tyres to go onto, which is great if you want to run a set of scrub slicks on a damp track for example. This is one of the features that sets ACC apart from other sims in my opinion. The extent to which you can finely tune the car on the fly, if you have enough buttons on your wheel that is. I've actually done a little rig life hack and repurposed my shifter since all the gear changing it is done with the paddles. So I use first for traction control up, second for traction control down. Third is ABS up and fourth is ABS down and fifth is mix up and sixth is mix down. Anyway, to get a proper feel for the whole grid, I made sure to take every car out for a decent handful of laps at the same circuit. In this instance, Bathurst, simply because it has a good mix of corner types, elevation changes and a honking big straight. And also, of course, because I need to represent Australia at every possible opportunity in case the government decides to do a deep dive on my permanent resident visa. So I guess you can call this the unofficial DDF Racer review of the balance of performance, but this is by no means extensive or probably even factually correct. This is just my personal findings after some limited testing. To get a proper idea, I'd probably need to spend much longer discovering the nuances of each GT4 Challenger, but for a day one first impressions video, it'll do. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments Comments, by the way, what, what do you think of the different cars? How do you find they all perform against each other? Now for reference, each of these runs was done using the default aggressive car setup that comes with each car and locked track conditions to make sure that every single run had the same variables. Up first is the Alpine A110. My best lap time was a 2 minute 16.875 and the top speed this car got to was 261 kilometers an hour. Now it feels like there could be a lot more speed in this car but it's just so tricky to unlock it as it's hard to get confidence. It's very loose on the rear, particularly on high speed corner entry, it's very peaky on the revs so you really need to use the high end but to be fair it is great on the brakes. You would definitely want to work on the setup though on this car to make it more stable for longer events though as it could be quite stressful and quite nervous if you try and just hang on. The Audi R8. My best time in this car was a 2 minute 15.099, with the top speed being 260 kilometers an hour. Now this car gets heat in the tires very quickly, a little too much actually, it's, the rear started overheating from the third lap onwards and it just doesn't like slowing down either, the, the brakes aren't super responsive and it really does struggle to turn while it brakes, so you really need to try and trail brake much further into the corner but not as heavy on the brakes. It, it really doesn't like the curbs either and it's quite bouncy so once you do hit those curbs the car is unsettled for quite a while so you just need to be careful on the bumps as well. But as long as you stay within all of those parameters it's quite a predictable car and quite a stable feeling car. The Aston Martin. My best time was a 2 minute 15.393 with a top speed of 263 kilometers an hour. This thing is a unit. It weighs an absolute ton, it doesn't change direction particularly well and it likes to understeer but somehow it is rapid. So much top speed, so much mid corner grip, it just feels planted and it just sounds angry. Now as long as you're not too greedy, it's very easy to knock in lap after lap in this car. I mean, I was straight on the pace and even if you do push it, then to be honest, everything kind of happens in slow motion. You know, the rear doesn't snap out suddenly, it kind of just gradually steps out and it can be saved very easily. 
the BMW M4. My best lap in this car was a 2 minute 15.177 with a top speed of only 255 kilometers an hour. Now this car is very stable to drive and confidence inspiring, although the gearbox is a little bit odd. I mean, I never found myself going below third at any point. If I did pop it into second, it would just unsettle the car and also sixth is more than plenty at top speed at the end of the straight. I immediately felt comfortable pushing this car, had lots of grip and I could really lean on it, but you gotta be careful. The rear has a tendency to kick out suddenly, especially over curbs, so it's not like the Aston where it's more of a gradual loss of grip. This does kind of bite halfway through, so just be careful with that. The Chevrolet Camaro. My best time was a 2 minute 15.429, and the top speed was surprisingly only 259 kilometers an hour. Wow, the noise this thing makes is just incredible. It's so much louder than all the other cars, and with an engine like that, you would expect plenty of top speed, but no, it's been BOP'd, so it's not as mighty in a straight line as you'd think. The gears are quite long as well, I mean, you only just pop it into six at the end of the straight, and you're regularly using second gears in the slower corners. It's also a very heavy feeling car, and if you are in the wrong gear, it does struggle to get up the hill here at Bathurst, so you gotta use the revs, which means that your inputs are also gonna be very intentional. It's not a responsive car and you have to plan in advance where you want to turn and brake. That said, it is actually more than capable of keeping up with the other cars, but you do have to lift out of the throttle in the corners a lot more than the other cars in the GT4 pack. The Ginetta G55. My best lap was a 2 minute 15.651 with a... No, that can't be right. A top speed of only 240. <laughs> Now, as far as I can tell, you can't change gear ratios on these cars, which is slightly awkward, as it tops out in 6th gear at, like I said, 240k. That's it. Compared to the other cars, this is a huge deficit. 20k to pretty much every other car, and it's, it's, it's not even like it runs out of power. It's bouncing off the limiter halfway down Comrod. However, the grip in this thing is insane. So much pace through the corners and on the brakes too, so you can really throw this thing around. Although if you're too aggressive, the rear will go. It doesn't like curbs either, and it gets very unsettled very easily. However, on tight and twisty tracks, this thing will be a weapon. But give it a straight line, and you'll be waving as everybody breezes past you. Even at Bathurst though, with the BOP, the Ginetta was only a few cents off the pace which was a massive surprise. I thought I'd be much further off than this. The KTM Crossbow. My best lap was a 2 minute 15.837 and a top speed of 255 kilometers an hour. The first thing I noticed about this car wasn't anything to do with the handling. It was the clutch. This car is so hard to get going from a standing start. It's kind of embarrassing, really. There's just no bite, no bite, no bite, and then bam, all of a sudden you've stalled. But what about the actual handling then? This car is one of my least favorites to drive over in race room, and I can confirm it's the same here in Assetto Corsa Competizione. Before you get to the apex, there is so much understeer. The car just, just isn't interested in turning in, yet at the same time, the rear feels like it's a giant pendulum and just wants to come around. So you're stuck in this really odd place in the middle where the car is simultaneously not responding, yet it's on a knife edge. And then once you get past the apex, it's just oversteer city. It's it's just not a nice car to drive. The top speed is down on most others too, so there's not really any redeeming features as far as I can see. And to be honest, I probably won't drive this car again. The Maserati Gran Turismo MC. My best lap was a 2 minute 17.832 with a top speed of 251. Now there's only one way you can introduce this car. No traction control, no ABS. Compared to all of the other GT4s in this pack, this one has absolutely no electronic assistance. So this might be the worst, but also the best thing about it at the same time. Let me explain. With all the other GT4s, you can slam on the brakes and the accelerator. You can really throw the car around, and if you push too hard, then it's all right. The electronics are gonna save you. Not in the Maserati. You can easily lock your brakes and get massive flat spots on the tires, or just spin out just like that on corner exit. So why does this make it the best car in the pack? Well, because it actually teaches you how to drive. With the electronics, they don't make the car faster. They just help you avoid binning it. By triggering the ABS, it's not actually making your brakes more effective. It's just stopping them from locking up, which is still gonna cost you time, but just in a less spectacular fashion. Same as traction control, it does save you from the wheel spin, but at the same time, it bogs the car down on acceleration. All things considered then, yes, the Maserati is a handful to drive, but 
unfortunately it doesn't trade this difficulty for speed. It's slow in a straight line and the lack of confidence in the corners means that, for me at least, it's a full second off the Alpine earlier which was pretty slow to begin with and over two seconds off most of the cars in this pack. Now I don't doubt there's a ton more speed to find in this thing once you get the hang of it, but for the average racer, it's probably not the best choice. That said, I still expect to see people picking it anyway, being fast, and then kind of humble bragging about, oh, I can cut it in the front in a Maserati with no TC or ABS, and therefore I'm better than everyone else. Yeah, I can really see that actually. The McLaren 570S. My best time was a 2 minute 15.648 with a top speed of 266 kilometers an hour. This is a car that feels like it should be a lot better than it actually is. The brakes are superb, the car rotates really nicely, and the speed in the straight line is actually the fastest of any of the GT4 cars, but it's a tricky balance keeping it on the road. Although the mechanical grip is good, I think the aero definitely suffers as the understeer on high speed corner entry is pretty bad. And throughout the rest of the lap, the car was sliding around quite a bit as well, e even with the traction control turned up a notch or two. This thing just chews through the rear tyres and it is very hard to stop them from overheating. And rather oddly, I wasn't able to adjust the brake bias either. All in all, this could be a great choice for racing considering the top speed, but you're gonna have to keep that rear in check. The Mercedes. My best lap was a 2 minute 14.193 with a top speed of 265 kilometers an hour. This car is OP, no question about it. Within three laps of driving this thing for the first time, I was able to beat my previous best in any of the GT4 cars by nearly a second. And now I think about it, I can't actually bring any negatives to mind about the Mercedes. I mean, it's got top speed, but it also has great brakes, the grip feels like it's limitless, and at no point during this run did I feel like I was going to understeer wide or lose control of the car. I could really lean on it through the corners, and I just had such a sense of confidence. I, I actually think there's still plenty more time to find, which kind of makes it feel like picking the Mercedes is cheating. The Porsche 718 Cayman. My best lap in this car was a 2 minute 15.309 with a top speed of 260 kilometers an hour. All of the traditional Porsche handling characteristics are present in this car as you would expect. Plenty of off throttle rotation and when you plant the throttle coming out of the corner it pops the front wheels up and the steering wheel becomes more of a suggestive decoration than an actual turning device. Still, it's an incredibly satisfying driving feel and actually not too slow in the general BOP scheme of things. I didn't feel like the car was too unstable at any point and was just trying to kill me. In fact, I'd go as far as saying it was probably one of the easiest cars to drive out of the pack. Now if you do want to feel like you're driving a hardcore Porsche in ACC with that impending feeling of doom hanging over your head every time you touch the brakes, then go and drive the Alpine. That thing was deadly on liftoff over the steer. Now, this testing is all well and good, getting a handle on the individual cars themselves, but the true test surely comes when they're all out and tracked together, all at the same time. Although the lap times are pretty similar thanks to the BOP, there are massive differences in how each car gets their speed, so how does this work out? To find out, I did a 20 minute race against the AI at Silverstone, in pretty much an exact copy of the video I recorded a few months back when I first tried out ACC, except this time driving the GT Force and a little bit shorter. My car of choice was the Aston, simply because I drove the Aston GT3 in that race. I'll post up a video of the full race at some point over the next few days guys, so if you want to watch that and want to check out some pure just no commentary gameplay footage then make sure you subscribe to the channel if you aren't already to see that. But for the purposes of this video, I'm going to summarise. How was the racing? Well it's probably going to come as no surprise, it was pretty good. The AI handled it well, although there were a few moments when the cars kind of slowed each other down trying to get past each other, but that's because th the way these cars get their speed are just completely different. Some are fast on the straights, some are great through the corners, and I, and I think that the AI just got a little bit confused sometimes, and there were a few times when they would be going side by side and it was just easy pickings, but on the whole, just very good, very good racing, and just just exactly what you'd expect from ACC really. The cars themselves are just as polished as the GT3 counterparts because I know a few of you guys were a little bit concerned that you know there's 11 cars being released at once, they, the quality might not be as good as, as, as the previous GT3s in ACC but no, they're just as good. And the HUD is pretty much the same also, it behaves exactly the same, looks exactly the same and just some of the manufacturer logos look different. Like I said earlier, I haven't been able to properly try out the multi-class online yet but 
the HUD is a key area that will need to be done right and you know you're gonna have to be able to differentiate between the two classes on track. At the moment it looks like a blue triangle is put in the corner of the car icon to signify a GT4 car which should do the trick and you can also split the menus down into overall positions or GT3s and GT4s individually. Quick side note guys, I'm a fully trained audio engineer and one of the things that I always look for in a new release or a new game is the sound design and ACC is absolutely fantastic, it just sounds great and I was looking forward to the GT4s because I know there's some mean sounding cars, especially the BMW, but the one that really, 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 really stood out to me was the Chevrolet Camaro. I'm not going to explain why, just have a listen to this. Having to worry about how the HUD and menus handle multi-class racing offline against the AI isn't an issue in ACC as, well, you can't have multi-class racing offline against the AI. Perhaps the devs are having issues getting the AI to work properly or maybe it's a licensing issue with the SRO, but to be missing this vital feature is by far the most disappointing thing I discovered when making this video. It needs to happen. Not everybody can make league races or go online and the quality of public lobbies if you do, as with any racing sim, can vary massively. There's also a few other things that I think the developers could work on too. Now I'm not on about the rather predictable DO SOMETHING OTHER THAN GT CARS rant that seems to do the round every time there's an update or patch. Come on guys, we all know what this sim is about by now and hoping for there to be open wheelers or the Nordschleifer and then being disappointed when there isn't, it's just a bit daft. However, something that has plagued a set of course of competition since day one is poor VR performance. Now I know some of you might just say, well get a better computer, but that's not an option for me or probably the vast majority of sim racers to just drop several thousand on a new graphics card and CPU, especially when other sims run perfectly fine and arguably look better in the process. Take for example Automobilista 2, it runs like an absolute dream on the same hardware, even with the graphics settings on high. Decent frame rates? No problem. Head back over to ACC and it's a precarious balancing act of trying to make it not look like a potato, no offence Yelly, but also not grind to a stuttering halt at the same time. There's just something about the way the virtual reality is implemented through Unreal Engine 4 which is really resource intensive with ACC. Maybe it can be improved, maybe not. It might just be the way UE4 is, but for big time VR racers like myself, it's incredibly frustrating, especially when you look at how beautiful the game can be outside of VR. Also related to this is the HUD and overlays in VR. Running on a monitor, you get the lovely built-in ACC HUD with a wealth of to be fair, rather valuable information. You also get this in VR too, but the image that's mirrored onto the monitor, the one that's actually used to record all the in-game footage, doesn't have any of these overlays. It's gone. Not even the in-game menu show up, so when you're sat in the pits going through the setup options, or even in the main menu going through the multiplayer lobby or configuration options, it just doesn't appear on the screen. Perhaps, again, it's a restriction of the engine, and I know I could just use the Oculus or the Steam VR mirror, for example, to get those overlays, but they'd be moving around all over the screen whenever I move my head. When you look at Automobilista 2, and even Race Room, you can move your head around freely in VR, and the HUD will still be displayed and stay fixed on screen. Why can't ACC have this? It'd be perfect. For me to recreate this feature, I have to rely on a third-party piece of software called SimHub, and make all of my own overlays. To be fair, SimHub is absolutely fantastic, and I've been using it on all my videos for years, but it takes a while to wrap your head around it at first, and can be incredibly time-consuming to put together a custom overlay. Which is actually another thing. It doesn't always work. Because SimHub is a third party app, it relies on someone completely independent from the ACC development team to reverse engineer the data from the sim and build around it. There are so many features missing from SimHub which you get on the default in-game HUD such as the formation lap graphics which show you where you need to form up on track, also the race position standings are broken and don't display correctly most of the time. There's no tyre wear data available either which makes trying to display strategy information on the screen kind of redundant. It's not just SimHub though, Crew Chief is affected too. This is another third party app which uses many sim shared data and many people rely on it to be their race spotter, telling them vital information over the radio. Chief. 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 
But in ACC, it just doesn't quite work right. It's gone to the point where the crew chief developer has basically said he's discontinuing support for the game just because it throws up too many errors and wrong information, which, which is a shame. There is a built-in spotter in Assetto Corsa Competizione, but it doesn't have the same level of detail as crew chief. Also, I've kind of gotten used to hearing Empty Box tell me when there's a car left or right. It's just not the same without him. Car inside. Still there. Hold your line. And one more thing before I wrap things up, but to be fair, this is me just being a lazy nitpicking sim racer. The in-game car livery editor is a little bit restrictive. Now I know there's licensing issues and the manufacturers only want their cars represented in a certain way, but only being able to pick from a handful of pre-made designs, swapping the colors around and not having your own custom logos is a little uninspiring. There are ways around this of course, and with a little research and effort you can put your own skins in the game with some Photoshop and file replacement wizardry, but wouldn't it be amazing if you could do it directly from within the current livery editor and it be automatically used server side for multiplayer events? Say for example, loaning a transparent PNG file of a logo and just being able to resize it and position it freely without trying to work out all these wireframe maps and panels joining up. So. All things considered, would I recommend purchasing the GT4 DLC pack? Oh, hell yes, absolutely! If you consider yourself to be a fan of sim racing in any capacity whatsoever, then stop what you're doing right now and go and get this. And while you're at it, maybe stockpile some food, water and toilet roll, if there's any left by now that is, and move a mattress next to your sim rig. Tell your loved ones you're going on vacation for a while and lock yourself in the room for a week or two. Trust me, you'll regret it if you don't. Assetto Corsa Competizione was horribly engrossing and addictive before, but this new GT4 DLC pack just takes it to a whole new level. The attention to detail is incredible, the immersion just sucks you in and you'll spend far more time in the sim than you realise or would care to admit. If you are a fan of modern GT racing then honestly, it doesn't get better than this. Thank you so much for watching this video guys. If you made it this far and you enjoyed it, then please don't forget to leave it a like and share your thoughts in the comments as well. Let me know what you think of these GT4 cars for ACC. I have a feeling I'm going to be doing plenty of races with them, whether I upload videos or do live streams. So if you want to see me in action with all of these new cars, then make sure you subscribe and press that notification bell. Thanks again for watching, guys. Look after yourselves. I've been DDF Racer, and I'll see you all real soon.